uh, yes. thank you and welcome to our next uh, talk so by La larry anderson herbert bernstein who will be talking first about laronian institute and then and I, the science I'm, go I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about the ronin institute of which herbert and i are both members and first what is a ronin a ronin in japanese history is uh, a wandering uh, man who served some master and no longer does. Uh, there are two classic movies about this. The Seven Samurai were Seven Ronin. And there's another movie, uh, Kushungura, uh, The 47 Ronin. The idea for Ronin Institute was to provide a kind of a home for people who are still doing research but are no longer in academia or not closely related to academia or perhaps out in industry. Uh, I was uh, a crystallographer for many years, but I made my living as a computer programmer. And then I retired. And you know, rather than have just my home address when I would go to a meeting as you know where I was from, the Ronin Institute was very convenient. And they, you know, they have a typical kind of uh, structure, uh, you know, advisory board and the president, and the president is actually the founder of it. Uh, in 19, uh, actually, I think I have the date a little later, it's, I think it's a little before 2014. It's based in Mount Clare, New Jersey in the USA. And a man named John Wilkins wanted to be, wanted to create an institute. And so he did. And he is still president. His research history from Harvard and the Southwest Research uh, Institute is in evolutionary biology. And it is an entirely virtual institute. Anyone can join. There is no fee to join and no yearly fee. No, it's a convenient place to have as uh, you know what I am part of. And that is all. And now we will go to here in full screen. Uh -huh. Did that work? Can you see my slides properly? Okay. A new efficient algorithm for measuring the distance between unit cells. Uh, this is a project that Herbert and I have worked on for quite a few years. Uh, it, and I'll go through the history of that a little bit. Uh, we have invented several methods of measuring how different two crystal lattices are. Uh, some of them have been more useful than others. This is work in progress. It's been, a, in some sense, a work in progress for a long time, but it is uh, still this particular part of it that I'm going to talk about today is not finished. There are probably some new things for us to discover. Uh, let me move this farther out if I can. No, that's not what I wanted to do. So, ooh. One of the things that originally interested us was how to look up crystals in a database of crystal information. And I don't know if I can get rid of that. Okay. People started collecting information about 1669 when Steno was asked to produce a catalog for a collection of minerals. And this, you know, this got more and more complicated. And in the 1800s, people were collecting interfacial angles and making catalogs of that. And then in the early 1900s, we start getting unit cells and we started getting catalogs of that. And then Nigley and Delaunay, roughly 1930, uh, made ways of standardizing unit cells and all of this appeared in books, some by Wyckoff and some others. And they were not very convenient to use. Uh, they were useful, 
But for instance, they divided the different crystal classes. So the monoclinics and the orthorhombics and rhombohedrals and cubics were each in their own sections. And for instance, if you had a rhombohedral cell that was you know, slightly distorted from a cubic, you would have to go look in the cubics and in the rhombohedrals. And maybe you think, oh, maybe it could get a little more distorted. And then you'd have to go search in the uh, orthorhombics and they were not consistent in how they were put together. So the first online database was the chemical information system. And I can't read the date. Oh, we don't have a date on it. Anyway, about 1980, in the late 1970s, uh, Herbert and I were asked to put together a database, a, a database system for determining unit cells. So central to all this is reduced cells. There are basically three kinds of reduced cells. There's Minkowski, which is defined in n dimensions as for n dimensions, it is the n shortest non-coplanar, non-linearly dependent vectors. And as Phil just was saying, there's no algorithm for determining this above uh, dimension three. It's uh, at that point an NP complete problem. And in fact, it is part of some of the one uh, of the uh, encryption systems used. Selling reduction is somewhat similar in it uh, reduce, it minimizes the off-diagonal terms of a higher dimensional uh, metric tensor. And then the Dirichlet cell is uh, the region of a cell to, surrounding a lattice point. And I'll come back to that in the next slide. The different reduced cell types. The Dirichlet cell, <coughs> come to last. The Nigli cell is the uh, Minkowski reduced cell, except in three dimensions. So it's the three shortest non coplanar vectors. And the lengths of the three vectors are sorted. So it's A less than B less than C. Well, usually it's called the Delaunay cell. Uh, which is the selling reduced cell in three dimensions. And then the Dirichlet cell, the Voronoi cell, and the wigner zeitz cell, or cell zone of influence and domain, or just zone, can be used with any of these. So, you know, we have the Voronoi zone, we have the wigner zeitz domain, or the wigner zeitz cell, and it leads to some confusion. Those three things are the same. We tend to use the Dirichlet because Dirichlet was many years ahead of both Voronoi and Wigner, but it's all the same thing. There are two problems with reduced cells. The first is that the unit cell parameters, A, B, C, alpha, beta, gamma are lengths and angles, and they have experimental errors and you, ha you have to be, if you're going to look things up in a database, if you're going to determine if two things are the same, if you're going to uh, try to determine the Brevet lattice types, you need to allow for some errors. And this becomes the nearest neighbor problem, also known as the post office problem. <clears throat> the second problem is that the, with it, the, it's related to experimental error from any lattice. It's well known you can choose an in infinite number of unit cells, but the reduced cell uh, may change with slight changes in the uh, experimental parameters, ABC, alpha, beta, gamma. And so you have to be aware that you may change the lattice type. And as an example, two cells from the same cubic lattice simple cubic lattice 10 10 10 90 degrees all around and 10 10 10 120 120 90 are cells from the same lattice only the first is nigly reduced and uh, slight variations in the cell would make the second one be the reduced cell 
So there, there's a, 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 an increasing complexity due to this. So what are these metrics used for? Brevet lattice determination, you know, is this cell close to being raw behavioral, for instance? It's used for determining crystal structures in electron microscopy. It's used for searching databases of unit cell parameters. There are quite a few of these online, uh, at least three that I know of that allow searching for the unit cell parameters of proteins. It's used for protein structure determination. This is an interesting use that is uh, becoming more common. The, the people go to the synchrotron and they get their unit cell parameters. They go in and search for uh, proteins that have similar cell parameters and then just blindly take that protein and do the very rapid step of uh, rotation uh, function. And it solves the crystal structure frequently because of the conservation of structures and proteins. It's used in serial crystallography where at the synchrotron and the, uh, the free electron lasers, they collect hundreds to thousands to sometimes hundreds of thousands of still photographs of the lattice. And then each of those has to have the unit cell parameters determined. And then you have to determine, are these cell parameters related to those cell parameters for all of these? And this is done by clustering analysis. And as we heard in Maximin last year, which is for crystal structure prediction, you predict thousands and thousands and you want to know, oh, I've already got this one. Well, if I do, I don't want to have to uh, include it in my list. Some of these require high accuracy and speed. Serial crystallography, where you've got hundreds of thousands of these, it's better to do them fast than, than slow. And, and uh, some of the calculations are quite expensive in terms of computer time. So, in terms of the Dirichlet polyhedra, Federoff in 1885 determined that there were only five polyhedra that can uh, tile space. Uh, you recognize the, uh, the cube. Actually, it's not a cube, it's a rectangular parallel pipette, and the hexagonal prism, and then some other ones. And they all have the same volume as the unit cell, and any primitive unit cell in the lattice. So oh, the most common reduced cell the crystallographers looked at is niggly reduced cells. When they say reduced cell, that's what most of them mean. And we based our space our, on the niggly cell parameter, three shortest lengths, as Phil was saying. And the space G6 is, the term, is defined as A squared, B squared, C squared, and then the dot products of, of the three axes. And these are actually the elements of the metric tensor. The problem in this space is there's a lot of boundaries, 15, and the transforms at the boundaries are not unitary in some cases. And that leads to a lot of complexity in the searching. So later we described the space as six, it has the advantage of being homogeneous where the previous one had two different kinds of elements. And these are, uh, it, when you define a diagonal as the diagonal length of the unit cell, A, B, and C, these are the six dot products among those four vectors. And in the reduced cell, the fundamental unit is, has all of these six negative and in a six dimensional space, you're now in the all negative orth end, and that's convex. Whereas in G6, it's not convex. And there's only six boundaries. They're all the, roughly the same. They're just related by symmetry. They're all of a single type. So it's a nicer space. But going back to the experimental error, both of these require, if you're near a boundary and crystallographic cells are often near boundaries because they have things like 90 degrees and 120 degrees. 
Then you have to, to go through the transformations of the boundary to see what's nearer on the other side. And maybe that's near some other boundary and you may have to, or you may have two or even three boundaries you have to look at. And there can be an exponential explosion of the depth that you have to search, sometimes thousands. So that can get expensive by computer. So we wanted to search for a new wit method. When we went to Maxmin last year, we saw how useful the Dirichlet cell, the Wigner's site cell, the uh, Voronoi domain was in calculations and how stable it seemed. So we thought we would look at that. It was proven by Hart two years ago that in order to calculate the Dirichlet cell, you only need to start from the nakedly reduced cell and look at the lattice points that form the edge of the cell surrounding the origin. And that's 26 points, only 13 of them are unique since they're related through the origin. So we thought we would look at those 13 distances. And uh, of course, the cell we're looking at is forms a polyhedron, those same five Federoff cells, six, eight, 10, 12, or 14 faces. That's the same thing again. So this makes sense as a distance measure as long as you don't cross through a boundary and change what Federoff polyhedron you're in. We did some experiments and the 13 parameters do remain continuous, but they change position in a list. If you list them, but you know, for instance, you might say, oh, I want 100 first and 010 and then 001 and then 110, et cetera. And in that way, it would not remain continuous. You do know that the smallest two values will always represent the lengths of the A and B axes of the crystal. That's guaranteed. And the C will always be one of the smallest, seven smallest values. That's useful, but not complete. So we thought about things we had done in the past. The International Center for Diffraction Data maintains a database of hundreds of thousands of powder diffraction patterns. And one of the methods of searching is they simply take the eight strongest reflections from a powder, sort them by intensity, and then search on those eight. In the chemical information system that we worked on years ago, the NMR system identified materials by picking out the spectral lines and then sorting them by intensity. So we decided to sort the 13 distances by magnitude. And our initial work indicated that seven seemed to provide a useful, the seven smallest of those provide a useful metric. And the experiments demonstrated the distances were largely similar to those computed by G6 and S6 measures. And here's two examples. Uh, what these do is they take some non-reduced cell, which appears over here, and takes the same lattice and the reduced cell, takes 100 steps, and then calculates the distance from the first cell to the second. Well, the first and the second represent the same lattice, so they're zero distance apart. And in this curve, this little blue curve is the S6 distance, and this gray curve was calculated with DC7, roughly the same. And here's another example on the right that shows the same kind of thing, even to the extent where there's a little shift here in both of them. Are seven sufficient? Well, we we're doing some experiments that seem to show that it wasn't. So the, 
The next question that we had was, can this be used to determine brevet lattice type? So in order to do that, we had to develop the characters for each of the brevet lattice types. And by that, I mean, as an example, let's look in G6 at what would be a primitive cubic lattice. Well, a primitive cubic lattice would have A, B, and C equal and three 90 degree angles. So the character for that would be R, 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 since they're, the first three are A squared, B squared, and Z squared and then zero, zero, zero. And that would be a representation of the general vector in G6 for every primitive cubic lattice. So one of the things we would have to do in D7 is go and do the characters for them in order to convert back to the Brevet lattice types. So one of the steps that we haven't done yet is create software to verify that the characters that we derive are correct. And Herbert has been deriving the characters. And the, the next question was, what is the number of required values is seven enough <clears throat> in the DC vector? And one of the things that came out of the determination of the characters was the first case where at least eight were required and we're expecting for the monoclinics that there will be a couple more. So seven is not adequate, but eight might be. Now we were talking recently with Vitaly and he gave us an example based on his research where seven was not enough. And so I took that example and this is the same kind of curve that we saw before, except it goes from one cell to another that aren't from the same lattice. This, this is one of Vitaly's examples, and this is the corresponding one. And we see indeed that with DC7, it starts from zero, even though we know the two lattices are not the same. And in fact, the S6 distance tells us that it's not. So then we tried eight and eight made them match quite well. So is eight enough? Perhaps uh, we, we will see from as our work proceeds, but it's certainly not much of a change. So what's left to do, but one of the things is finish Herbert's work. Uh, one of the things that I have been doing is uh, generating samples for each lattice type and singular value decomposition to verify that the characters that we get make sense and agree. And uh, then we will proceed farther. And at this point, I will turn it over to Herbert. So I should stop sharing. Thank you. Okay, and I will start sharing. Okay. Sure. Okay. Now, I am share. I am sharing. What, what, what would be the next slide. And because I just have a little confirmation that I did this in the in the right size and people can see the whole slide. Yes, yes, okay. Okay, fine. All right, so here's where we are. We, we have G6, we have DC7. In DC7, we're starting with the 13 uh, uh, distances within in the nearest shell to the origin. And this corresponds to the distance between pairs of faces from the general Dirichlet cell. In most cases, the highest symmetry cases, the seven shortest are sufficient to characterize the niggly reduced cell. That's not terribly surprising. 
that if you look at the normal uses of the Dirichlet cell, most of the, the, the cases as, you, as you're in, in higher symmetry are using fewer parameters. I mean, the, the, the cubics are basically, you know, one, one free parameter. When you get up to the monoclinics and, you, and, and, and you've got four, things start to go wrong. Uh, um, Curlin and Bright have this nice example of a triclinic, which really starts to go wrong back in, in, in the monoclinics, where if you look at it as G6 vectors, it's 6, 8, 10, 8, 4, 2 versus 6, 8, 10, minus 6, minus 2, minus 4. And this is a very good example of where if you use just the seven elements, you're going to bring together a larger equivalence class than you may want for things which are triclinic or monoclinic. And in, the, in this particular case, a very good example, the disambiguation requires you to move to an eighth element. Okay. Now, the, as I said, if you, if you just look at the higher symmetry at, 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 at the, you know, say the cubics, the characters are very straightforward. There's one parameter in it. Basically, anything you took that 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 would take you up to, you know, even six would would, would work. Seven is certainly sufficient. You look at the eighth, and and you know, it 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 just sort of marches along nicely. Okay. You look at the 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 uh, 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 TPs, and again, the the first seven are sufficient. The eighth would be a nice thing to have, but it is not necessary at the high air symmetries. You look at, uh, yeah, the, the, the TIs. Again, it's get, it is getting somewhat complicated. But let's just stop here a moment and consider, suppose we were trying to use these characterizations. How would we use them? Well, if you look at the case breakdown, what is happening is you have hyperplanes. And the way you would use this kind of characterization is very simply looking at your probe, the distance to those hyperplanes. And the things with the smallest distances would tell you the cases to look at in more detail with the parameterization that would go with them. Okay? And this continues very nicely. You, know, you go, go on, on with the hexagonals. The number of cases seems to be rising alarmingly. Notice that, 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 that when I get to 49D, okay, I'm looking at, it, it, it's broken down into three cases of different range. There, there are gonna be three hyperplanes in there. Okay? Then I look, look, look at 49B, I've got three. Okay? I, I uh, move on to the orthorhombics. Ooh, the number of cases didn't grow too badly. Okay? Now, if it, it yeah, if I look, ah, that's gone up a little bit more. I'm now up to four, okay? And I go to, you know, to, to 50, 50 B, and I have another four. It's not growing the cases exponentially this far, okay? However, I get up to 52 A, and this one has been causing me trouble. There is a low population sixth case in here. And this is a place where I want to do an ad for computer experimentation. I know everyone looks at all the nice, perfect results that appear in the international tables and appear in the final literature, et cetera. But the reality is, for the centuries in which people have been doing this, everyone who has worked on this has made mistakes. And there have been things to correct. It is really a wonderful world we live in now that you can do computer experiments to go through and clean out the mistakes. So it is actually possible to generate character tables and such that are reliable and computer software based on them that is reliable, but it takes time. Larry's men at work sign is very, very important. One should not rush this. One goes at it at a reasonable pace. Okay, and, and you know, the, the, Characterization continues, you get into the, the, the monoclinics, and fortunately, 
it's not exploding in terms of number of cases, number of hyperplanes you would need, need to look at. And I'm going to stop there in terms of, you know, there's some MCs, and the MCs continue, this goes on, and is quite frankly, exquisitely boring detail. And one of the biggest risks in terms of making mistakes is falling asleep while working through these. Okay? But we're getting there. It shows promise. My own estimate is that for most work done at synchrotrons and, 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 and you know, for routine crystallography at things at higher symmetry, it's going to be DC7. And then there are going to be things with, with yeah, some things are going to require DC8. I have yet to see a real case which requires a nine. And I've been looking, I have not seen a nine at all. Um, it's getting there, it is making sense. Why we keep doing things when we have things that actually work computationally? Because it gets faster. And when you're working at a synchrotron, as I do, time is very short. You need to do these things very, very quickly. And our thanks to my wife, Frances, for many hours of copy editing, and our thanks to Elizabeth, uh, Larry, Larry's wife, for her very fine artwork. And uh, I will be a polite person and point out there is, is a bibliography and having put it on the screen, I now declare myself done sharing. And I think I've actually done it within my time limit. Of course. Uh, Larry and Herbert, thank you very much for your talk. Let us thank both of you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Philip, of course, it, it's okay to leave at, uh, at, at, at any time. So don't, don't worry. Uh, we understand that we are all in different time zones. Uh, no problem. Uh, no problem. Let me stop.